Training apex level hypnotherapists and psychotherapists since 1988, the Institute for Psychosystems Analysis is now accepting applications for CADA 3 of our professional training course, taught online by Steve, Pauline, and myself. If you resonate with the material on Young to Live By and believe that your calling is to be a therapist, then check out the link to our course webpage in the description. We look forward to welcoming you on board in June of this year, 2021. Hi everyone, today we got a question from someone in our Discord server who goes by the name of Grail Squire. And he says, how do I create ego boundaries that are right for me? I've tried to make myself do things in the past and I only ended up, as I see it now, disrespecting my psyche or going against my nature. I most simply understand it as trying to be a judger in MBTI terms, while I'm clearly not that. I cannot have that happen again, but I do not know how to be productive and achieve my goals, not that they're very well specified, which may be the problem, as my INTP self. I'm very confused, and in many more ways than I can articulate. What are some practical steps? How do I draw the line between myself and others? And does my age make it harder? There's an enormous amount in there, Steve. Perhaps we should focus on this idea of achieving goals and productivity, which seems mm. to be what Grail Squire wants to solve. I don't know where you want to start with that, though. Yeah, I would say lose the guiding fictions mm. for a start. And that's, that's an Adlerian term, if you want to look it up. If you're not familiar with Alfred Adler's uh, model, uh, he might suggest to you, or certainly an Adlerian therapist might suggest to you, that even conceiving of yourself in a Myers-Briggs uh, four-letter code or, or whatever sense is a guiding fiction, and that will limit you straight away. For example, if you were an INTP, you would know full well what your interests were. Um, you wouldn't need anybody to tell you. So either you're a, a malfunctioning INTP or you're not an INTP or a Myers-Briggs framework's just irrelevant for what you're actually trying to work through. Um, what emerges from this for me, and there is further background information that you've you've offered, is that you've been influenced by an awful lot of uh, people out there yeah. on the internet and some... Uh, so I call them pop psychology ideas, broadly, which has led to some confusion. I would say, first of all, the first practical thing you can do is junk all of that and then reframe yourself right from, from the start. What would you say, James? Yeah, it sounds like there's... A, it, to be fair, it reminds me a little bit of myself a few years ago. Mm. I'd go into this state all the time. It would operate on a waveform, to be fair, yeah. of uh, doing something in the world and then going back into a very, very introverted state. And what people will notice is when you're in that extroverted state, these kind of ruminations never come to mind. You're kind of in, in a flow state, you're just doing what you're doing. So it's the ruminations themselves to tackle, I would yeah. say, rather than actually the nature of the ruminations. Because there's always an infinite number, as you said, ego yeah. fictions you can tack on to distract yourself with. Yeah. Because then if you continue going down like a Myers-Briggs route, there's so many ways to distract yourself mm. with that too, including like career options, mm. say for an INT, and it's like, well, actually, maybe I'm interested in, in music instead. Or yeah. what? And it could be anything, which sounds ridiculous yeah. on the surface. Yeah. But that's, that's why I say, yeah, if, 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 you, if, you, if you scrap all of that stuff away and return to about your essential nature, and then, for example, the, the parameters, if you like, for a personal myth, yeah. then you can then take a real bird's eye view of yourself objectively and be like, oh, okay, so I need to do this, yeah. this, 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 and not say that you're INTP or a judger yeah. or blah, yeah, blah, 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 including the idea of not being productive and not achieving a goal, even yeah. the idea of setting for yourself a goal because you feel like you need to set yourself a goal. It's, a, it's another top-down framework that even that could trap somebody. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Um, follow your instincts as well. Um, look up the work of Yak Pangsep and Mark Solms, Professor Mark Solms. Follow your instincts. You'll sort yourself out if you do that. Um, and as James said, and I said earlier as well, that lose the ego fictions, lose the guiding fictions. Uh, they'll just leave you trapped in rumination. And a provisional life, you don't want that. You want to live life to the full.
Okay, and this question comes from Gospel of the Wolf. And he says, Speaking personally, my history of opiate addiction provided a warm, enveloping feeling that provided energy and a sense of safety that could be compared to the womb or an early relationship with the mother. Simultaneously, there is a withdrawal of all external relationship. When sober, however, there is a deep need to access creativity and relationship in order to recover from the addiction. Is there any connection between the anima animus and addiction, such as a misplacement of the relating instinct seeking satiation? Sa sa would be the correct term there. Yeah, um, that is quite a deep question. What I would suggest to you uh, again is that the relating system is something that you need to exercise out in the world. An opiate addiction is not a natural thing. We have endogenous opiates, but the addiction to opiates as introduced externally or extrinsically as a substance is not natural. So your instincts, if they are guided or shaped by an addiction, it necessarily follows that that is not a natural you know, ex expression of, of their intent. Definitely. So, yeah, the, the very fact that when you become sober, as you describe it, you find there's a need for creativity, well, that's uncovering the real dynamic that's at work at, behind all of this. And that's the thing that you should engage with most productively. So from a psychodynamic point of view, if you're not so addicted that you can't do without it, that you're pretty much permanently in that state, that you can access uh, your anima, presuming that this is a, this is a male that we're speaking uh, to, then you should engage with the world through your relating system. And that will move you away for, or from the psychological need for addiction. Yeah, I, I just want to say here as well, when you say that your opiate addiction provided a warm enveloping feeling and you've linked that to the womb and the mother that's quite um, that's quite a Jungian thing to do to link these sort of symbols together and there's potential that that could be a lead to go down but there's also potential it could be a distraction oh yes especially if you're just approaching it it's like when you talk about the forensic attitude of mind yeah. it's like so this is a potential link mm. and then you hold it there that would be mm. something because especially we, we see this all the time with, with the audience and like intelligent people and usually, usually intuitive thinking types too, yeah. which yeah. is you know something you talk about in the course actually, the mm. IPSA course, where I'm kind of a case study some of the time. You're like you throw sand in the air, James, or your complexes throw sand in the yeah. air to try and distract. It's a similar thing that could be taking place here. But in order to just go down the opiate, um, the opiate addiction treating, I guess, would you, in guess in your clinical experience, mm. would you see that differently to other forms of addiction, or would you first and foremost start with addiction? Therefore, there's an instinct that's misaligned. Somewhere. Well, the, the normal approach would be to obviously to, uh, to tackle the substance itself and the dependency upon that. Um, I, I tend always to think in a light to move kind of way. I'd be looking for an angle around what is obvious. Uh, the psyche does prefer that. It doesn't like the same kind of approach, the same kind of rope prescriptive approach. And you find that people who are addicted to substances go through this revolving door, yeah. uh, particularly with the in the UK with the National Health Service, for example. So I would always be looking for that which wants this person to get well, uh, that which was frustrated initially that probably led to them trying the substance in the first place. Mm. And then, uh, as you say, with respect to the forensic side of things, look for what's hidden beneath it. You'll be able to see parts of it emerging through the overall pattern of, of what's going on in that person's life. We're helping them to join that up. So, yeah, I, I'd be very lateral in my approach and would work very much towards homeostasis as a principle and gradually a person acquires an engagement with life that contradicts the need for the substance and they feel liberated by it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the most we could say without knowing any more about yeah. the particular case in question. Yeah. yeah, we would. We would need to know a lot more of context, but in, in a broad sense, that's what I would suggest. That's what I've done with people and it, it does work, whether that's cigarettes or it's, it's something far more serious, such as opiates. Mm -hmm. This question comes from Gospel of the Wolf, and he says, I have known personally two chronic hypochondriacs. I can observe their life aims as being unlived. What are your thoughts on hypochondria as a neurosis based on the fear that life will end without having been properly lived? Hi, yeah, thank you for that. Um, it's a common, a very common condition in, in broad terms, uh, and it's been around for a long time and recognised as such for a long time. 
it's not the actual problem, though it's the most, or one of the most symbolic of all transductions between mind and body that you can get in terms of the meaning or the, the symbolism behind something. If somebody is in a chronic hyper, hypochondriasis uh, state of mind, um, you need to look at what the intentionality behind the symptom is. And there's, there's a saying that we use at IPSA, which is follow the libido. And that's a forensic attitude of mind. Um, we've said before, haven't we, that there are three basic ways of understanding um, depth psychology. There's a philosophical standpoint, a mm. scientific one, and a forensic one. Of the three, the forensic is the most efficient and effective clinically. Uh, the philosophical approach, you'll run out of explanatory power very quickly with that. Uh, the scientific method is self-limiting. It's not its fault as such, it's just that it does self-limit. Mm -hmm. Forensics, though, you have to have a different attitude of mind to follow something forensically, in the sense that you're looking for what is not there as opposed to what is there. Uh, scientists tend to look for what is there. Uh, even if they're testing a hypothesis, it's like, what is here? But a forensic approach would say, what's missing? What's missing will give us the context of meaning. So when, when you have a person's life and the full context of their life, and then within that you find this hypochondriasis, then you have to follow the energy. So you start first of what's manifesting, which will be the symptoms. So their energy is going into their symptoms uh, and then see if there's a symbolic representation for that that stands for something else. You will almost certainly find that there is. Uh, you may end up playing a game of whack a mo as it moves around mm -hmm. and, and converts mm -hmm. into something else. That's okay, that's not a problem. Uh, don't chase it too far though, because you're getting distracted by the sand waving that it's throwing up. But there will be something behind it within the, the autobiographical through line of that person's life that will tell you what that is, what the real cause of it is, and you need to follow that. So forensics, and again, I, I think I've said this before, that if you were doing a forensic investigation into corruption, you would follow the money. If you're doing a forensic investigation into depth psychology, you follow the libido. You don't follow it, though, in such a way that you allow yourself to be distracted. Remember, it's always what's missing rather than what's there. The libido will guide you through the symptoms, but it will also show you what's missing. Don't be just so, you know, tied up into tunnel vision that you just chase these symptoms around as they float all over the place, turning up in one part of the body and then the other. Look for what's missing that actually joins the symptoms up and gives them meaning within the context of that person's life. And as for uh, the fear of life while end without uh, being properly lived, well, Jung himself said that fear of death at bottom is actually a fear of life. It's quite normal young people should be afraid of death. They should be discouraged from um, dying because they're, they're, meant, they're meant to breed, they're meant to mate and relate at the level of instinct and of the genome. So you should have a normal fear of death. You should follow other pursuits that ensure that you live and that your loved ones live and that the, your mating partner lives and your children live. So that, that's not a great problem. But when it becomes amplified out, into a hypochondriacal uh, situation, you will probably find that in some sense they're afraid of life. What will that be? It's likely to have its uh, source in early adaptations and the influence mm -hmm. of parents. Uh, the parents making the child afraid of engagement with the world uh, and then overly attached to them so they can't differentiate their identity out from the psychology of the parents, which Jung said was a, a really, really important thing. and. If you can't solve that, according to Jung, it's impossible for you to individuate. You have to separate yourself from the psychology of the parents. But if you're still functioning as if you were a frightened child within the orbit of your parents' psychology, mm. of course you're afraid of life and therefore symbolically of death. So, yeah, that would be the angle I would put on that. Mm. What do you think, James? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a good example for bringing up the difference between the depth psychology take and say like a cbt style mm. or a coaching style take but like a cbt i've seen i've seen it before actually and with coaches well they'll take someone with hypochondriasis and they'll try and be like well you're fine you're fine you're fine you're fine you're fine and to, and i know you don't believe me so what i'm going to do is send you to a doctor and then the doctor goes you're fine but then yeah. what the person will do oftentimes is they'll doubt what the doctor has said and then mm. they'll go online and self-diagnose with all kinds of things i've seen it as well where you can actually swap the particular thing that yeah. using hypnosis you can swap what the person is worried about 
and it can be swapped with technically anything, anything yeah. hypnosis. Yeah. So it's like it's something in your unconscious mind, or yeah. it originates in the unconscious mind, but you are semi-conscious of it, that's just worrying about something. Mm. And it's, it's not even so much worrying, this is getting more forensic, is it's drawing your attention to something. Because yeah. if you really follow libido in general, an extroverted person who's properly actualized is not sitting there ruminating. So something is causing libido to go in and then yeah. constant focus on whatever this particular thing could be. Or with some people, they, there's nothing on their body, nothing in their mind. They're mm -hmm. just worried there about death and where death might one day come. Yeah. So you can't engage with it. I think this is what you say about the whack-a-mole mm -hmm. thing, right? Yeah. You can't just engage with it and follow it down because then it will shift and change all over, over the place. It will shift. So like with anything, I guess you, you could take this as, okay, there's something uh, I don't really want in my psychobiology which is clearly troubling me. Mm -hmm and you're going to make the knights move around it to yeah. get down to the level of instinct. Yeah. Like with many of the things that we're talking about, I guess. Yeah. It's the same with OCD, uh, and they're very closely related. I have worked with people, and I've, I've shocked them when they've come in and told me their story, and of course you're supposed to accept the story. And I would say to them, for example, that's not what you're worried about. Mm. And they insist it is. I said, no, it isn't. And our job is between us to find out what it really is and what the meaning of your symptoms are within the whole of your life narrative. Mm. Uh, and you'll usually find that that's resisted uh, because people like to indulge the rumination. They, they feel animated. Some of their libido is giving them a little bit of a secondary gain. Uh, and that, again, is an unpopular thing to discuss that somebody might actually enjoy being in this state um, mm. because they, they do get a bit of a kick from it and they get attention for it. There's all of those secondary gain issues. Now that's not to, uh, you know, to, to accuse people of doing that as a primary motive, which is why it's called secondary. It's secondary to the real issue. Um, and sometimes to build rapport, you have to do an unusual thing, such as to say quite bluntly to somebody, that isn't the real issue. And that uh, your psyche knows that you know that it isn't. And more importantly for me as a therapist, I know your psyche knows that I know. And if I'm going to help you, then we need to get down beneath the surface. So just to, I guess, quickly on um, the guy saying hypochondria as a neurosis based on the fear that life will end without having properly been lived. Could that, if someone's going to take that statement and say, this is what's always underneath hypochondriasis, yeah. is that a similar mistake, if you like, or generalization to say that smoking is always to do with the oral phase, Freud's oral yeah. phase and attachment to the mother's breast? It's like it's it's potentially related, but it's not necessarily what's underneath it. Because what would be yeah. beneath that, if I'm looking at it, would be you can't really do anything with that because no. it's almost a philosophical statement. Exactly. That's, that's not to accuse Gospel of the Wolf of anything, but it sounds good to sort of say that. But yeah. if it's underneath it, if it is, you can focus on mother and father or yeah. whoever raised you or that early environment. Yeah. Now you've actually got tangible data to work yeah. with. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. And this falls into that model of philosophy, science and forensics. Uh, um, I would put CBT into the attempt at being scientific uh, and that's self-limiting. They can only deal with what they can tinker with in the immediate moment. It's something that, which is, you know, repeatable, controlled, that kind of thing. And this is where you get the behavior modification mm -hmm. techniques from as well. And because they are scientific in a sense, then they feel that they're justified and justifiable. But a forensic approach is completely different. You're so, so into what is not manifesting, what is hidden behind the obvious. Yes. Um, and, and that will unravel things properly and unravel them in depth. Yes. So that's the way to go. If you're looking to take your study of depth psychology and personal development to the next level, using Steve and Pauline's 40 year long clinical experience as your personal guide, then make sure you check out Young to Live By's flagship offering, Discover Your Personal Myth Ultimate Handbook. For anyone who has a calling deep in their very genome to become who they truly feel they should be, this guide is utterly indispensable. Pick up your copy today and make 2021 the year you truly begin to become yourself.